and it's got a nice interface that works on an iPad. Normally, I would just hold it from Alpha or Mathematic. Um, and then uh, we're going to either do an example, if I don't cover it in the homework problems, we're going to do an example from uh, 11 9, or we're going to motivate. When I did the last section, I did motivation for Taylor theory. So it's not really 10 10 yet, but linking off the ideas we talk about when I do the demo, I'm going to tell you like what a Taylor series is. And you've seen it before, why we do it the way we do it. Okay, so the first thing we should talk about is are there questions on the homework that I can answer? And if there aren't, I have kind of a meaty one that I can, that I, that I can do for you. But I would be happy to start with like with your exercise. Yep. Oh, this isn't homework, but uh, for this quiz tomorrow, does it help? No. Not yet, because I still have 10 students out like across my classes. So that's another quiz that doesn't count, which is annoying, but we'll get there. In fact, I, I, I mean, they, now they're saying that this, like, that people should be back in class within, for like mid February or something, is what they're saying. Like, you know, basically everyone, basically everyone on campus will have either had it or been exposed to it. So, like, I expect classroom attendance to pick back up again. In this case, we'll switch back over to uh, graded quizzes. Unless, Unless the reaction to graded quizzes are so overwhelmingly negative that I choose not to do it, but like I think you get some beneficial feedback if I do. Um, okay. So, oh, one more question. Yes. Question five. Okay. Was um, function m over x squared? Ten over x squared minus two x minus one. Kind of a dog, <laughs> but not as much of a dog as it looks. Because every time I see something like x squared minus two x, I think I bet I'm going to be asked to complete the square on this question. Because remember, this chapter literally the only way that you know how to do a power series is with this. The goal is this pattern: one over one. That. One over one minus something, right? If I can do this, I can make a power series. Problem is, this isn't written like that. Do you guys remember when you were asked to do inverse trig substitution? There were the really irritating problems where you had to complete the square first to get it into the x squared a squared form. This is one of those. So what you do is you write ten over x squared minus two x minus twenty four, and then you. You leverage your massive experience with completing the square problems to realize that obviously what you do here is rewrite this as x squared minus 2x plus 1 minus 25. Yep. What if you were never taught how to complete the square? Well, well then you, <laughs> that's like being told that you can drive a car, but you don't know what a speedometer does or something. You gotta be able to complete the square. All right, I'll, I'll, let me actually show you why, like, why this works. Because okay. I, didn't, I didn't get this. Uh, okay. So actually, let me let me do a real quick like a real quick uh, complete the square reminder on this question because the technique is important enough that everybody should be comfortable with it. Okay, so the basic idea is that if you have something in this form, if you have something in the form x squared plus two ax plus a squared, you can write it as a perfect square. Yeah. Right? If you foil this, you would get that. That's just this is just an algebraic fact. So the idea is. If I get something and it's not in that form, I can add a number to make it be in that form. Mm -hmm. So if I do something like x squared plus business problem minus 2x, well, x squared minus 2x is not in the form x squared plus 2x plus a squared. But if it was, if it was, minus 2 would have to be equal to 2a, mm -hmm. which means that a would have to be equal to minus 1. So how can I make it have this form? Well, if it was going to have to, if it was going to be forced into this form, there would have to be a plus a squared right here. But what's a? A is minus one, right? So if a is minus one, then that means that I would have x squared minus two x plus one because minus one squared is one. Now, this is cheating though. I can't just add one. Oh, I don't like this problem. I put one in there. Like that's illegal. So if I have to balance it by also subtracting one, like I've unsimplified a zero, basically. Mm -hmm. And now what do I do with this part? Well, that is one of these. I, I set it up so that this, this number right here makes it factor like this. 
That's completing the quiz. Regardless of whether methods you've been taught, this is really what's going on. So my fancy trick right here is really just noticing if there was a plus one attached to this, it would be a perfect square. X squared minus two X plus one factors as X minus one squared. So I want there to be a plus one there, but it's illegal for me just to add one to something. So I also subtract one. So I've unsimplified a zero into a plus and minus one. This part turns into X minus one squared. That's starting to look an awful lot like this. Way closer now because now I've got something squared down there. I didn't have that before, but now I do, right? The X, I don't have two X's, I've got a single X. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take out a minus 25 because I really need to be a positive one down there. But currently, there's a minus 25, right? So I'm trying to force this to be in that form. So what I'll do is I'm going to store the 10 over here and I'm going to store a 25 out here. And what's left behind, let's say a negative 25. And what's left behind when you do that? Well, there's a one on top. The minus 25, when you divide it by minus 25, turns into one. And x minus one squared when you divide it by 25 turns into by negative 25 turns into minus x minus one squared over 25. Of course, I could do better because I, that 25 really should be living inside this if I want to do this kind of actually from here I can I can just do it directly from here if I want. It's in the right form, right? Now it's one over one minus a thing. So. This is a form I can use the power series on. Because it's one over one minus something. And what the geometric series formula tells me <laughs> is that, right, so now what do I got? 10 over x squared minus 2x minus 24 is equal to 10. Why am I writing 10, 26? Whatever. <laughs> Negative 2 fifths, 1 over 1 minus. X minus one squared over 25. But what does this pattern say? It says anytime I've got something that looks like this, I can write it like this. Right? Anything, anytime I've got something that looks like one over one minus the whatever, I can just put the whatever into this ge geometric series. So that means this is equal to this. Sum of x minus one squared over point five. That makes sense. So now you can do some manipulation to make this look slightly nicer because there's a two here and an n out here. Really, twenty five is five squared. So if you wanted to, you could rewrite this as. There's x minus one to the two n, and then there's this five squared down here. Oh, five to the two n. Twenty-five is five squared. Five squared to the n is five to the two n. But damn, I got this minus two fifths rolling around out front. It's not a power series yet. It's minus two fifths times the power series. So what do I do with the minus two fifths? Multiply it in. What is this five going to do that at five to the two n right there? And I add one to it, right? These fives are in the bottom, that five's in the bottom. You got two n fives plus one more is five to the two n plus one. So this thing turns into the sum of n equals zero to infinity and something like minus two times x minus one to the two n over five to the two n plus one. And you only have one question left is what's the radius of the conversion? Right? This is the power series. Where does it converge? Well, what rule? Not, okay, you can use the ratio test on it. This, it's always legal to use the ratio test on a power series, but we can be slightly better than that this time because I know what the radius of convergence of this series was. Whatever's inside the box has to satisfy that its absolute value is less than one. What did we put in the box? We put in x minus one squared over 25, right? 
So I plug x minus 1 squared over 25 into this box. So I can solve this for x. I mean, what this says is that the absolute value of x minus 1 squared is less than 25, which is the same as saying that the value of x minus 1 is less than 5. Center of the series is 1. Radius of convergence is 5. Make sense? When you're dealing with this geometric, plugging into the geometric series approach, whatever you plug in has to follow the rules of geometric series, and then it's just algebra. Yes. Yeah. Because the anytime you've got something of the form x minus a is less than r, this is the form that tells you the radius of convergence. It's distance from the center to the edge. Now, the actual interval of convergence for this is all numbers five units above one and five units below one, right? So where we would actually consider the series would be here. Notice I'm leaving the endpoints out because the power series typically, okay. <laughs> there you go, there's a professional email for me. Um, yeah, she's the, the department chair of the, or department chair, she's secretary of the math department. Oh, there you go, look at sign, also. look at sign some more. Um, Right, so when we're doing power series, typically we don't check endpoints because we like to consider power series on the interior of their intervals of convergence. So radius is usually the important question. So I'm actually curious if I got this question right. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna test to see if this is the power series for that function because I'm just gonna put it in decimal and check. I can do that. If, the, and this, uh, this is part of what I'm gonna do to show you what a power series is, what it's for. Like, this function right here, if that showed up in an application, I left the physicist out last class, so let me include the physicist this time. If that showed up in a math problem, or a physics problem, or an engineering problem, or a modeling problem, or a science problem, or a computer science problem, I think I got everybody. Insert your own additive in here if I missed you. Um, uh, you wouldn't want to work with this function. It's a rational, it's a rational function. It has asymptotes that sucks to work with. Its derivatives are going to be, you have to use the quotient rule. God help you if you have to use the quotient rule. Oh, three derivatives of this is going to be a nightmare, right? So instead, what we'd like to do is say, like, to sort of clarify what a power series is, I'm going to graph this function. And then I'm going to graph a couple of terms of this polynomial, and I'm going to see if they match the degree to which they match, because this is supposed to be an approximation for this. This power series is supposed to be this function. The whole reason we do this. Okay, for those of you that are on the computer, I am gonna turn my camera, but the contrast on this is so high, probably, is there anybody? There's one person, I apologize. I will, I'm gonna put the demo up on the Canvas page if you can't see this, all right? So probably you just see a brightly glowing screen, but maybe you could see a sign function, I don't know. All right, so. Let's actually see what we're going to do here. Here's my claim. All of this work showed that this function is equal to this. When x is in that interval right there, from minus 4 to 6. It's a power series, and normally in power series, we don't check endpoints because we can't do calculus at the endpoints because derivatives don't make any sense. Derivatives are not one sided objects, they're two sided objects. Okay, so what am I really saying? Well, let's actually compute a couple of terms of this power series. Like when I put n equals one into this, what comes out? I'll get a minus two, and oops, I get an x minus one squared. On the bottom, I get a five to the third. Is that the n equals? Uh, it's supposed to be n equals zero. So that's the n equals one term. What's the n equals zero term? Just minus two fifths. This is n equals zero. This is n equals one. Please correct me if I'm wrong here, because if I'm wrong and I plug this in, I'm going to look like a moron when I 
graph these things and they're not equal to each other. Am I right? Okay, so let, let's actually verify. Let's let, let's see exactly how uh, how possibly wrong I am here. If I put a one into this function, x equals one, what number comes out? 10 divided by, okay, so there's a one minus two minus 24, which is a minus 25 on the bottom. I have 10 over minus 25, which is the same as minus two fifths. Okay, at least my value matches. Okay, so let's actually plot. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> I'm, used, I'm used to tragedy. Okay, so y equals um, 10 divided by, okay, now keep, keep an eye on the polynomial that I'm putting in here. X squared minus 2x minus 24. Yeah. Okay, and we want to show this thing between these values. Okay, be, okay, so that's actually a good illustration. Now, y minus 4 to 6, you see this thing has asymptotes at negative 4 and at 6, which explains why that radius of convergence is what it is, right? Okay, that's the thing we're trying to model with a polynomial because working with this is going to suck if we have to. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, instead of that, let's start writing down some of this, uh, some of this power series. Minus two this. Oh, oh, sweet. Okay, at least. Okay, first question. Where is the series centered? Where is the series centered? It's centered at one. So our approximation is going to be located right there. That's the anchor point for what we're doing. Okay. Let's add the next term. All right, so we're going to add. Uh, actually, does anybody have an idea why there's only even terms here from the graph? Why are we only going to get squared and fourth and sixth and eighth? Yeah. And the odd power would do the, my math, say whatever. It would, it would be, it would be one I'm, I'm waiting for somebody to do the dance like you different. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, because the function is even, right? It's symmetric uh, around this axis right here, which means it's sort of even like around the axis of symmetry, x is equal to one, which is why we expect only to see even powers. Okay, what was the next term? Oh my God. Minus two. Well, minus two divided by, all right, five to the third is 125. And then we multiply that by x minus one squared. <laughs> we'll delete that, x minus one squared. Okay, so adding another term now, notice our approximation was pretty okay at the beginning, but now what we've done is we've got something that's starting to approximate the way that this thing is curving, right? Adding polynomial terms says it's curvature. In fact, if you think of in terms of derivatives, what's going on here is this is a polynomial whose value matches, whose tangent matches, because this has no slope at one, and whose concavity matches, right? The second derivative matching means that concavity matches, right? The increasing or decreasing sort of concave, up concave, down stuff. And the more terms you add in, the more this is going to force these derivatives to match. The more closely this polynomial will approximate this function. Actually, so let's go one more here. So if we add another term, we get minus 2 x minus 1 to the 4 divided by 5 to the 5th. Okay. Minus 2 divided by Five to the fifth times x minus one to the fourth. So the more terms we add, the more sharply this thing starts to bend down. That's the function. Yep. This kind of thing like so the center maybe the convergence. So the complex of the problem on the z-axis then. Yeah. So with, it's actually impossible to memorize to, to visualize what's going on with complex numbers because. A complex function is two-dimensional inputs and two-dimensional outputs, so it's actually a four-dimensional object, and uh, four-dimensional objects are really hard to visualize what's happening. Okay, but yeah, I mean, it, it, the same sort of thing is happening where you're getting things that are curving more and more, so that they match whatever the curved object is. So now, if you look at this, and somebody said to you, "Where is your approximation? This approximation, this terrible function. It's not even that bad, but it's pretty." <laughs> Whatever. Okay, so you wouldn't want to work with this. If you're a working scientist, you're trying to model quickly, and you've got hundreds of thousands of data points in a computer, or you're a physicist and you're trying to understand the basic behavior of a system, 
or your mathematician and you're working, we don't care about what happens for very uh, like small values of you know deviations of x or high powers. Somebody could say to you, all right, use this fifth degree polynomial instead. Where is my approximation good? I mean, the, the, the motivation for this is a fourth order polynomial is about the easiest object that exists for doing calculus on. You could integrate this, you could differentiate it, you've got approximation for all of these values in here that you can compute without ever having to divide. Computers hate division, okay? Engineers hate thinking of systems as being built out of things like this. They prefer to think of what polynomial behavior, scientists, mathematicians of all kinds, like to think about what is the polynomial behavior of a function or a solution. And as long as I stay basically within the range from negative two up to four, I don't ever need to think about this function at all. I can just use this one. Why would I use that if I could use this? That's the point of power theory. Power series give you a way of replacing things that are hard to work with computationally with things that are easy to work with computationally. So when I look at this, I think to myself, okay, well, locally, this looks like a function that's like a parabola or a fourth degree function. And it's, you know, there's a really powerful theorem we'll learn in the, in the next section about that tells you when your approximation is good. This, this one is good basically, in, I mean, that's a big range, right? As long as you stay away from the asymptotes, this approximation is awesome. So I'm gonna show you one more. And this is not a series that you've learned yet. So I'm gonna write it down and assert that the power series is true, but then I'm gonna show you that it's true by showing you what a plot looks like. Yep. Is the power series over the top match up well? Like is it not easy to function? Okay. So it will always match well, it will always match well at a point like this. But you can imagine because really what the game we're playing here, because the last thing I'm going to show you today is that really what's happening here is we're matching derivatives. We're saying what polynomial matches its derivatives at all levels to that function. If the derivatives get really big, really fast. So like the worst function I know, and, hope, and what you should think of as the worst function you know, is this function, which is unfortunately common. It's so bad, I'm going to write it over here. And that looks like this. As x goes to infinity, the inside goes to zero, right? So x is going this way, but driving this to zero, but that means that you're getting this like, I mean, as x goes, sorry, as x goes to zero, this gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So you got a function that goes like this, and then it starts going. <laughs> the closer you get to zero, the faster it oscillates. It's an awful function. That would not be something you want to approximate with a Taylor series because to calculate appropriately, you would need to calculate like a billion derivatives to do that. This is called the topologist sign curve, by the way. Um, it's funny too, because you know, high school teachers like to give that function in class and have students graph it. And then you zoom in and it's the same function and students just sit there and keep zooming and can't figure out why, why nothing is happening. Because no matter how closely you zoom, it doesn't change. It's, it's a self-replicating like fractal curve. I wouldn't do that to you. Anyway, okay, so I'm gonna get, I'm actually gonna do the sign graph for you and show you what the Taylor series is. Or not the Taylor series. You don't know Taylor series yet. You don't know what a Taylor series is. Pretend I didn't say that. Okay, so I'm going to assert y equals sine of x is also equal to x minus x to the third over three factorial plus x to the fifth over five factorial minus x to the seventh over seven factorial. Without justification, I'm just going to assert that. And now I'm going to try to use, <laughs> I'm going to try to use this to convince you that I've done the right thing here. Okay. So y is, I'm at, and actually there's a reason I'm using sign here because this is typically called the engineer's approximation. No engineer worth their salt ever works with sign, ever. In fact, what they teach you, by the time you're seniors, what they'll teach you is, oh, you're doing some problem and a sign, I don't know why I'm speaking maybe next time. Oh, you're doing some problem <laughs> and a sign shows up. What do you do? Get rid of the sign, right? And that's all, there's no such thing as sign, it's text. Yeah. Engineer's approximation, right? That is the engineer's approximation. Why do you say that? Well, if you plot this, you get, 
Well, as long as you restrict your vision <laughs> to right there, y equals x is a pretty good approximation for the sign of x, right? For a lot of values. So why do engineers and scientists and physicists and mathematicians just say, I don't know if it's being science? Because up to about there, they basically are the same. <laughs> for sufficiently small values of x. That's, that's the usual cop out. OK, so now, now, suppose instead, suppose instead you say, OK, that's not good enough. I want to approximate sine with some values out here. So somebody comes along and says, without justification, um, oh, well, look, you can actually just add this on, and you get an even better one. Oh, look. Now, now I, see, I lied to you. Sine isn't actually secretly x. It's secretly just a cubic polynomial instead. Right? There's no such thing as sine. There's just a cubic polynomial. Now, even at this point, even at this point right here, many scientists and mathematicians in, you know, with nice say will repeat would say, you know what? Pretty close to pi over two right there, minus pi over two. So what we could do is we could just take this approximation right here and then just slide it around. <laughs> where I need it. And I never have to ever calculate sine ever. I just calculate this third degree polynomial. Right? This is literally what people, I'm not, I'm not bullshitting you. This is what, this is what happens, right? Nobody does anything with sign. Oh, it's not, it's not, the approximation is no good because look, there's this deviation right there. Oh, fine. I guess if you really insist, I can add a fifth order to this. Right? So, okay, what's, what's, five, what's five factorial? Four times 120? No, four, yeah, five factorial. Five, four factorial is uh, six times four, which is I think we're 120. 120. It's 120. Oh, it's perfect. <laughs> just, just ignore this. And it's perfect. Oh, it's off. So there's no such thing as sign. It's a fifth degree polynomial. So why do people use power series? Because I can just pretend sign doesn't exist. There's no such thing as sign. There's just this wonderful fifth degree polynomial. And if I need to do anything with it, I can say, well, I can translate that thing and flip it upside down if I need to. <laughs> Because sine is self-replicating, right? So if I want to approximate out here, just say, oh, well, just uh, slide it over and flip it upside down, right? You got it. There's all kinds of transformations you can use to make this approximation work everywhere. So the point of power series is to get rid of that, which is a computational nightmare. Somebody wrote that down in front of you and said, what's the sign of one, right? I mean, what's the sign of one? I have no idea what the sign of one is. Oh, wait. The sine of one is about equal to <laughs> one minus one six plus one hundred and twenty. There, I found it. That's the sine of one, right? This is easy once you make this approximation. This is why you do power series. How does your calculator do it? No. This is what's going no. on. No. This is what is going on in the back. Oh, your calculate your calculator and any computational method you use for calculating sine is decomposing the sine into a power series of as many terms as it needs to be accurate, which you can calculate, computing a number by evaluating a polynomial and then pretending it's doing something on the unit circle. What is oh no, I asked it for something up here. Oh well, I'm gonna compute that number. And I'm gonna like translate it by not, like you know pi minus that number or whatever, and I'll get that back. Like this, there's no secret unit circle going on in the background. <laughs> it's just this. It's just Taylor approximations. You sit down in front of one of your fancy modeling software programs for differential equations in an upper division of engineering or architecture class. You've got to put a real system in electrical engineering with a circuit. There is no signs and cosines being evaluated. What's going on is in the background, it's solving things with power series and it knows how many terms it needs to be accurate and it's just evaluating polynomials. There's not a little you know, gnome inside, the sign gnome that like knows what the sign of one is. Yep. So does anyone actually know what the sign of one is? No. <laughs> I mean, you can analytically write, I mean, the sign of one is the Y coordinate of the point on the unit circle that you get by sweeping out one radian and angle. But like, it's an irrational number. 
nobody knows what pi is either, right? I mean, you can say, oh, pi is the, the constant of proportion that exists between the area of a circle and its circumference, but that doesn't mean you know what pi is. You can't, so sine of one is an irrational number. Who cares if you know what it is? You know as many digits as you need. You want a hundred digits? Okay, I'll give you more terms in the power series. Basically all math up to this point was a lie. I mean, <laughs> this is the, so math is like sort of like the gradual pulling back of the curtain in some way, right? It's like, yeah, right. So you learn all this calculus and then you realize that all anybody really does is power series, right? The best part about power series is that since they're infinite polynomials, you can actually like multiply and divide them as well. So, when, so the term for this, if, when you come across it is in any sort of like upper division text, the approach will be, oh, it's this plus higher order terms. And what do they mean by plus higher order terms? They mean, or plus O of X to the seventh is what I would write down if it was, if I was being fancy. What I would mean would be, oh, it's this approximation, sorry, this approximation right here, and then I don't actually care about this, plus stuff that goes to zero faster than X to the seventh. <laughs> Literally, this is, this, who cares, right? It goes to zero really quick, so it doesn't, doesn't matter. Zero times X to the seventh. Oh, oh, it's on the order. I told you guys about growth order. This is a growth order assertion. It goes to zero on the order of x to the seventh. Because everything else is x to the seventh, x to the ninth, x to the eleventh, those go to zero faster than x to the seventh, right? So, yeah, I mean, this is the way math is really done. Yep. You just like cosine. One minus x squared over two plus x to the fourth over four factorial minus x to the sixth over six factorial and so on. Tangent has one. E to the x. Um, one plus x over one plus x squared over two factorial plus x to the third over three factorial. As long as there's no asymptotes, yeah. I mean, really, so at the bottom, so like, I'm going to put a condition on this. That we're going to talk about when we get into Taylor and Palmer, which is everything is a power series as long as it has derivatives that exist. If you can't differentiate somebody, there can't be a power series because really what's going on here is I've come up with a polynomial that matches in value and in tangent line and in concavity and in third derivative, which some people call dirt for some reason. Um, oh, sure. Sure. Derivative of acceleration. Yeah. Okay, that's the sort of physics thing. But yeah, so like that's 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 really so but to do that in order to make that matching happen, you need the derivatives to exist. So if the derivatives don't exist, then it all falls apart. But who in their right mind works with functions without derivatives? Yep. I don't understand. They define sine based on the first series of the sine of the first series and the sign of the Oh no, really secretly? Okay, so okay. So look, no, 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 no. So there's a certain fiction that takes place in math classrooms, right? The fiction in math classrooms is we present you information in a way that pedagogically makes the most sense. We don't actually tell you how it was developed historically <laughs> because we're reading books, the guy has to choose an order to write things in. So you learn sign. The reason that you learn sign as, uh, so I give you the idea right now that secretly signs are just power series. That was discovered. Sign was a thing that existed because navigators like, you know, before Way before there were like any idea of power series, navigators had all kinds of trig functions for doing uh, like astral navigation when they were sailing, right? And sine comes from that. It really did. It really does start from the idea of like ratios of triangles. How can they do the sine if sine is a power series and nobody knows how to set the power series? Oh, they had giant numerical tables. But where did they get the tables? So a sine and a cosine at the core are just ratios of angles, right? So the function came from looking at the relationship between angles of a triangle. And then it turns out when you graph that, the function that you get out by graphing that, the numerical function turns out to be determined by a power series, okay? So this is the reason that science, so one of the re reasons that you should think, why did science suddenly explode in the 17 and 1800s in terms of what sort of problems it could solve is because methods like this started to be invented where guys that were working without computers started to get the ability to, to compute solutions to things because you could do this by hand. This is not something you could do by hand if you just got some arbitrary X, you wouldn't be able to do that unless somebody had exhaustively calculated out, you know, using like mechanical tools, the values of these functions. But yeah, a long time ago, somebody, I mean, sine of X is equal to X is one of the most ancient sort of cop-out estimates that exist, right? So.
Okay. So now, now, hopefully that I've convinced you that power series are useful. They are. Now I'm gonna, I, I wanna come up with a, what I wanna do is I wanna motivate like the next section, which is like, okay, what do we know right now and what are we missing? Because we're missing something. And what we're, really what we're missing is we have a really limited set of functions. I mean, why, how did I do that? How did I write that down? How do I know this is true? I mean, I sort of proved it to you with the graph. It's not really a proof, right? I just wrote something down and told you it was true. So the idea that this comes from is actually really easy to understand. In Taylor series before, it, you could have had a really good teacher, right? But the typical presentation of Taylor series that most people see the first time doesn't really explain what's going on, especially if you saw it in high school, where the point is to have you pass an AP test. Not really understand where these formulas come from. So what do we, what can we do right now? Do we know our series replace functions, right? In the sense that they, 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 they provide hopefully good approximations. But what can we actually do with them now? What functions do we have available? What problems can we solve with what we know right now in section 11.9? And the answer is, well, if it looks like this, I can use this formula. So geometric series-like objects are things I can work with, right? Yep. What else do we have right now? Oh, in the grand scope, oh, grand scope we, have, we have anything we can take derivatives of, right? But my, the, what I'm trying to motivate is like, yeah, I'm trying to motivate that question right there. What can we do with this method? I mean, this method is still useful because I don't want to take derivatives of objects that look like that. It sucks. Motion rules are terrible. But what else could we do with this? If you've done the homework, you've seen a couple other functions that we can get by taking derivatives or integrals of these guys. So, the integral of this is I shouldn't just hear a couple of people whispering it. Everybody should know this one. Our tangent. If you're going to be wrong, be wrong with confidence. Right. So I can deal with arc tangent type objects with this method because if I had a power series for this, I could just integrate it to get that, right? So arc tangent type functions can be dealt with with this method. There's another one that came up all over the homework. Yes. Uh -huh. The homework that clearly everybody has worked on. Yes. Yeah. So this object, if you, I mean, the, you take the natural log and you take its derivative, you end up with this. So natural logs also can very easily be thought of as power series, right? The derivative of natural log gives you one of these, and so you can build a power series for it by integrating. As long as you're careful, because it doesn't make any sense to center a power series for natural log at zero, because the natural log of zero is undefined. Okay? But again, but the same rule move applies, because you can take a derivative and get here, you can take an integral and go backwards, right? So arc tangents and natural logs and things that look like one over one minus x to the n. First problem is, Kind of run out of functions, right? I mean, that's it. And science would be pretty sad if the most complicated functions you could deal with were arc tangent and log, right? Not a lot of math to do there. So the question is, how did I come up with it? Like, what about all the other functions? What about everything else? What about general functions? And so you can think this method is almost backwards. We're starting with a thing we know and we're looking for series we can make with it. But I really want a method where I give you a function and you build a power series for me instead, right? So suppose that I had a sine graph. Actually, you know what? We talked about sine already. Oh, fine, whatever. Okay, we have a sine graph, right? Well, this is y equals sine x. But what I want is f of x, which is a polynomial that matches 
sine of x. And when we choose a center for a power series, what we're saying is I want it to match the sine of x at a particular point. So let's suppose it matches the sine of x at x is equal to zero. So I really like that matching to happen right there. It doesn't have to be right there, but I, that's what I choose with this particular demonstration. If I'm going to make a polynomial that matches the sine at x is equal to zero, what does f of zero have to do? Why? But it better pass through the point that sine passes through, or it's a bad approximation, right? Uh, whatever my function is, it better pass through that point. So f of zero had better be zero. Well, what should f prime of zero be? So f prime of zero says, what should the slope of this polynomial be? Y1. <laughs> Yeah, so you're back. You're using the, the the technique of the math classroom to back solve for the answer. <laughs> time honored technique. But why should it be? Why should the derivative of this be zero? Yeah. Well, it should match y prime of zero. Because it should match d by dx of sine of x at x is equal to zero. The polynomial has to have the same tangent line that the function does, or it's going to be a bad polynomial, right? I want this polynomial to match the function. It better match the function. And what is the derivative of sine at zero? Well, derivative of sine is cosine. Cosine of zero is one. So there you go. Nailed it by the iron law of math classes. That's right. Okay, so I need a I need a polynomial whose value is zero and who matches in first derivative with the function which is one. I can think of a polynomial who does that. By working forwards this time, what polynomial has the property that f of zero is zero? F prime of zero, one. Well, not hard to see. This polynomial does that. Right? That polynomial has the right value at zero, has the right derivative at zero, and if you drew it, you would get this. But we can ask for more. I want this polynomial. I, now I'm thinking about infinite series. I want a big polynomial with lots of terms. I also want the second derivative to match. The second derivative of my polynomial, I better have the property that is equal to the second derivative of my function at the same point. Second derivative, you can imagine, recovers uh, inflection, right? Conca change from concave up to concave down, or the degree to which it's bending. Zero in this case, because that's an inflection point for the sine function. Or if you like, this is. Uh, the derivative of sine is cosine, the derivative of cosine is minus the sine, this is minus the sine of x, evaluated to x equals zero, which is zero. How about the third derivative? Third derivative of my polynomial has zero. I better have the property that it matches the third derivative of my function because otherwise the curving won't, won't match, right? Okay, so third derivative of sine, so that's like sine, cosine, minus sine, minus cosine, evaluated at zero, which is minus one. Okay, what polynomial has those properties? Well, f of x has got to be x, because that does this one and this one. Two derivatives is supposed to be zero, so there doesn't even have to be an x squared term, because if I took two derivatives, I need nothing to come out, right? Three derivatives, something is supposed to be there. So there better be an x to the third right here, and some number has to be attached to it, so that when I take three derivatives of this function and plug in zero, negative one comes out. I need to be able to take three derivatives and put in zero and have a negative one fall out for this thing to match the sign. Okay, so let's take some derivative. F prime of x is one plus three c x squared. Second derivative is six. Maybe I'll make it more clear. Three times two times c times x. And the third derivative of f is three times two times one times c. Oh man, I know a name for three times two times one. Three factorial. And what does it need to what so what what was what was C supposed to do? C was supposed to have the property that when I 
took the third derivative of my polynomial and I put in zero, negative one came out, right? I, that's what I want to happen, the third derivative is match. If that was gonna happen, it must be the case that minus one is equal to three times two times one C. What is C? I'm gonna write it as minus one over three factorial, but yes. So the polynomial that does this, that matches in the zero derivative and the first derivative and the second derivative and the third derivative looks like this. Because the C value that has to be stuck right here, so the derivative matches, the third derivative matches, is minus one over three factorial. So this polynomial, the whole point of this is it matches, it has these properties. F of zero is equal to sine of zero. F prime of zero is equal to sine of X prime evaluated at zero. The second derivative of F is equal to the second derivative of sine evaluated at zero. And the third derivative of F is equal to the third derivative of sine zero. So it matches in the value, the first derivative, the second derivative, and the third derivative. This is what a Taylor polynomial is if you've never seen one before. The formula for a Taylor polynomial is this construction for a general function. So that's what we're going to, for those of you who have seen it before, what we're going to talk about next time is how to take this idea and generalize it to any function instead of just the sign. But the reason I could write down for the sign that I knew that it's series was x minus x to the third over uh, three factorial is because it's a, just the polynomial that matches a value, first, second, and third derivative. And the beauty of the Taylor series is that's enough to approximate not just the single point, but the whole function. That's the weird thing. This matches at a single point, but you saw that graph, how quickly this polynomial looks like the sign. So matching at one point becomes enough to match every, you know, not everywhere, but on a big set. That's the point of all this type of math really is. Once you have this method, you can basically build a, an approximating polynomial for any function that you can take a derivative of. Yep. Why for your last You can't keep, because it's just exhausting to keep going. Okay, but it's the idea you need to keep going. So generally, so where, where we're gonna go with this is that, you have to account for the fact that you took the powers down, that's where this factorial comes from, and that the coefficient of the nth term should be the nth derivative of f evaluated in the series center divided by the number of derivatives you took. This is a thing that should seem familiar to you if you've seen Taylor series before. And if you haven't, I will explain it when we talk about Taylor series. But this is the nth coefficient of the, of the polynomial that matches a function to any number of derivatives you want. All right, I'll let you go. Thanks for your attention. I'll see you tomorrow. This, of course, is not covered on tomorrow. Uh, 11, 11, 8, and 11, 9. And to remind you, yes, not, that's not graded.